Hello and welcome to the final part of immunity in the A-level biology series. Today we are going to cover antibodies, monoclonal antibodies and the use of vaccination to control infectious disease. As we covered antibodies in the previous video, here is a brief recap. Antibodies are produced by B cells. They are Y-shaped glycoproteins, also known as immunoglobulins. Antibodies consist of two heavy or long polypeptide chains and two light or short polypeptide chains joined by disulfide bonds. All polypeptide chains consist of a constant and variable region. The variable regions are highly specific for binding to specific epitopes of antigens. One antibody can bind to two antigens. Antibodies play an important role in the immune system and combating pathogen invasion. Knowledge of antibodies and their mode of action have been valuable to medicine. Monoclonal antibodies, which are produced after clonal expansion by B cells, after activation, have been applied to diagnostics and treatments. Monoclonal antibodies are produced from a single group of genetically identical B cells or plasma cells. This means they will all be identical to each other. Monoclonal antibodies are produced in the lab by the hybridoma method. First, mice are injected with an antigen which stimulates the production of antibody producing plasma cells. The plasma cells are isolated from the mice and fused with immortal myeloma or tumour cells to form a hybrid antibody producing cell called hybridoma cells. The hybridoma cells divide continuously in culture producing large numbers of monoclonal antibodies. These will then be purified for use in diagnostics and therapeutics. Examples of monoclonal antibody use in diagnostics are Enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, or ELISA. This is a test to identify if a patient has antibodies to a certain antigen or antigens to a certain antibody. An ELISA test commonly involves immobilizing an antigen onto a microplate and combining it with the complementary antibody with a reporter enzyme attached. If the reporter enzyme interacts with the substrate of interest within a patient sample, such as an antigen or antibody, it produces a signal such as a colour change. The intensity of the colour change can be measured and analysed to determine the amount of substrate of interest in the sample. The test for HIV uses this principle for diagnosis. First, the HIV antigen is immobilised on the bottom of the plate well. The patient's blood plasma sample is added to the well. The plasma will contain multiple antibody types. Only HIV-specific antibodies, if present, will bind to the antigen. The well is then washed out to wash away any unbound antibodies. A secondary antibody with a reporter enzyme attached is added to the well. The secondary antibody will be able to bind to the HIV-specific antibody, or primary antibody, if present. The well is then washed out again to remove any unbound secondary antibodies. A solution is added to the well containing a substrate reporter enzyme. The enzyme reacts with the substrate to produce a coloured product. If the solution changes colour, this signals the presence of the secondary antibody conjugated to the enzyme and hence the presence of the HIV antibodies in the patient's blood. Monoclonal antibodies can also be used in pregnancy testing kits. These kits detect the presence of human chorionic gonadotrophin protein, or HCG, which is usually present in pregnant women's urine. The application area of the testing kit will contain HCG antibodies bound to a coloured bead, which is usually blue. When urine is added to the application area, any HCG will bind to the antibodies. The urine will move up the test strip carrying any bead complexes with it. The test strip contains immobilised HCG antibodies. 
If HCG is present, the immobilized antibody will bind to the HCG antibody blue bead complex, leading to the concentration of the bead complexes in the test strip. Therefore, the test strip will turn blue. If there is no HCG present, the unbound beads will continue moving up the stick and no colour will be observed. As well as diagnostics, monoclonal antibodies can be used in the treatment of cancers. All normal body cells have cell surface markers which help to identify its own cells. Tumour cells have tumour markers which are antigens which are not found on normal body cells. Therefore, monoclonal antibodies can be made to target tumour markers. An anti-cancer drug can be attached to the monoclonal antibody, so when it binds to the tumour cell, the drug can accumulate in the local area of the cancer cells. This reduces the severity of side effects of the drugs as it is now localised to one area in the body, rather than systemic. Now we will discuss using knowledge of antigens and immunity to protect us against disease in order to produce vaccines. Vaccines are valuable in providing us with protection against an array of diseases. Vaccines are key in boosting the immune system against a particular pathogen without being exposed to the dangerous pathogen. Vaccines contain inactive or live weakened forms of disease causing pathogens. Due to the pathogen being weak or partial, the vaccine cannot cause disease, but it can trigger an immune response in the body due to the presence of specific antigens. The plasma cells can produce antibodies in response to recognizing antigens and produce memory cells, resulting in long-lasting immunity. Therefore, vaccines intentionally induce artificial active immunity. The MMR, or measles, mumps and rubella vaccine, is a live attenuated vaccine, which contains whole but weakened pathogens. As the pathogens are weakened but alive, they still divide, but slowly, giving the body time to recognise and fight the pathogen. Inactivated vaccines can contain whole dead pathogen, or small parts of the pathogen, which are specific to the pathogen such as proteins, sugars, or harmless parts of toxins known as toxoids. Examples of inactivated vaccines are for polio, which contains the whole killed pathogen, and diphtheria, which contains the toxoid. These types of vaccine do not produce a strong or long-lasting response in comparison to attenuated vaccines, so these require boosters after a certain number of years. For a disease to be completely eradicated by vaccine, the disease-causing pathogen should not mutate, have a life cycle including other organisms, for example malaria, have symptoms which are hard to diagnose or trace. The smallpox virus was easy to eradicate by live attenuated vaccine. This is because the virus remains stable with no mutation so no change in surface antigens, so the vaccine remained effective. Also, as humans are the only reservoir for disease, it was easy to break the transmission pathway. Therefore, understanding our immune systems and key players in fighting disease has been valuable in devising treatments, diagnostics and protection against dangerous pathogens. So immunity is now complete. Thank you for watching today's video. We hope to see you next week for the seventh video in the series which will be part one of energy and respiration.